I'm Olivier Morin and I'm here to talk about the way that coins signal values. This work was made jointly with my co-authors Barbara Pavelek and James Winters. I'd also like to acknowledge the help of our RAs Julia Bespamniatnir and Noro Schlorke. This talk is going to summarize results from two published papers, one of them in Cognition, the other in the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology. Both studies deep down are about exactly uh, the same question, which is uh, how coins signal value, how they encode information about the monetary value that the coins embody. But one of them is about modern coins, and the other is based on ancient coins from uh, the archaeological record. One way to look at coins is to see them as cognitive artifacts. Coins don't just carry value, they are not just economic entities. They indicate their value in a way that should be recognizable for human eyes and human brains. They represent monetary quantities, that's what they are for, that's what they do, but they should do that in a way that your brain can get. That is to say, in a format that is memorable and easy to process. How do coins do that? The, the question has been asked many times before, the, but the main conclusion of these studies seems to be that coins do not do such a great job of representing value in a way that adapts to human cognition. For instance, the most famous study on the topic, perhaps, is Nickerson and Adam's paper, which is a simple yet beautiful study where they just ask participants simple questions about the design of the one penny coin. Participants have to pick which of the designs on the left is the real one penny coin, uh, and on the right they're just asked to reproduce uh, the coin design. And they are basically, uh, not to summarize the study, at a loss. Coin designs like this one don't seem memorable. So this is one way in which uh, coin designs do not seem to optimally fit human cognitive preferences. Why does this matter? Well, because the way cash money looks affects economic choices. Even though use of money in cash has been on the wane recently, it still plays a massive role. And the appearance of coins and bills plays an important role in these exchanges. We know from a lot of fascinating research in behavioral economics, uh, psychology, ergonomics, that for instance, the size and aspect of bills affects their apparent worth. So a bill in mint condition will look more valuable. And there's also the famous money illusion where the exact same quantity of money will appear more valuable when expressed with a smaller denomination, so 100 cents instead of $1. The converse illusion where one $50 bill appears to be worth more than five $10 bill also exists. And there's the banknote illusion where bills are valued above coins, etc. It's also important for coins to indicate their value reliably. Confusions happen and they are costly. This has been well studied in the case of the euro. Uh, this is a study published more than 50 years ago, but that was already several years after it was launched. And it showed that a quarter of Europeans found euro coins difficult to use and difficult to tell apart. One consequence when coin values are not completely obvious is that it makes coin confusion and shortchanging easier. So this leads us to ask, what is the best way for a coin to signal its value? And the answer we're going to test is that coin designs when they indicate the value of a coin, solve what linguists call a trade-off between informativeness and simplicity. Let me explain. So, um, here's a map of a zoo. And on this map, it shows the, the zoo animals that, as they can be uh, found uh, on the, on the zoo, in the zoo. And on the right, you can see a complete list of all the animal species that you can see in the zoo. Now the map here strikes a balance between informativeness and simplicity. Uh, a simple, overly simplistic classification would be to say, well, in the zoo you have big animals and you have smaller ones. That, that kind of classification is overly simple. It's clearly uh, uh, uninformative for most purposes. But the list on the right, on the other hand, is the opposite. It is too exhaustive. It's very informative, but it's hard to memorize all the species. And, and, and some of these distinctions are useless for the average zoo visitor. So this map avoids the cognitive burden of the list by achieving a trade-off between the informativeness of the list and simplicity. The key principle here is that simplification is not random. There, is more, uh, pr there are more precise classifications for popular or interesting animals like uh, the elephant here. 
whereas other uh, less interesting animals are put in mixed bag categories like small carnivores over there. So the way that the map solves this trade-off between uh, simplicity and informativeness is by being much more fine-grained for popular animals and much more coarse-grained for others. So we know that linguistic categories tend to obey this trade-off between informativeness and simplicity. For instance, kinship terms categorize family members in a way that is much more fine-grained for close kin, like brothers and sisters, than remote kins, like uh, cousins. Color terms, likewise, are more precise for warm colors, which are more ecologically relevant compared to uh, cold colors. The goal we had in this study was to show this trade-off at work in a case of coins, that is, in a context that is not linguistic and that can be observed outside the lab, unlike previous non-linguistic cases where the trade-off was observed. We're going to focus today on coin designs, what we call designs is, in short, the images, the, the graphic symbols that are minted on coins. So in these studies, we're going to disregard anything that's written. That is, no letters, no numbers. Uh, letters and numbers are obviously uh, very important, very informative today. But this was not always the case. And in ancient coins, they were much less central. In many cases, they were altogether absent. Today, graphic symbols are a peripheral aspect of money because cash itself is becoming anecdotal for one thing, and also because you can look at the numbers and figures to tell you everything you need to know. But again, this was not always the case. When coinage first appeared, the designs were pretty much the only thing that made the difference between a bit of metal and a proper coin. And even today, graphic symbols matter. They can make different denominations distinctive in a way that stands out. But how exactly do they do that? So for coin designs, the informative simplicity, informativeness simplicity trade-off takes the form of what we're calling optimal denomination signaling. Let me explain that. Uh, suppose you have a currency. In your currency, you have denominations, that is monetary values, that have their own coins. One is a denomination, so it's two, so it's five, etc. Fifteen is a value, but it does not have a denomination. There is no coin for fifteen. We consider here adjacent pairs of coins, that is, coins that are immediate neighbors on the scale of value, for instance, one and two, two and five, one hundred and two hundred, etc. Now, an interesting property of all present currencies, and to a lesser extent, some ancient ones, is that denominations tend to be spaced in a roughly exponential fashion. So as you go up on the scale of monetary values, denominations are spaced further and further apart. A consequence of this is that the cost of confusion for two coins of a pair, the cost of mistaking one for the other, is much less important for small denominations and much greater for high denominations. In our example, the cost of mistaking a 200 for 100 uh, is uh, 100 times greater than the cost for, of mistaking a 1 coin for a 2 coin. So the confusion cost can be very low or it can be uh, very high. Optimal denomination uh, signaling means you don't want too many symbols, that's simplicity, but you want to keep your symbols to signal things that really matter, things like the elephant, that's informativeness. So you can repeat a symbol on a pair of low-value coins, where confusion is low, but you mark high-value coins with different designs. That, in short, is the, the kernel of optimal uh, denomination signaling. To test this hypothesis, we turn to a database of coins, which we assembled from various sources, books, Wikipedia, central banks, uh, and so on. The first challenge that we had to meet was measuring the coin's value in the same way across currencies. We use for that a unit that we call the smallest coin. For every currency, we take the smallest denomination in that currency and we count how many small coins there are in each denomination. So 10 euro cents is 10 times the smallest euro coin, which is 1 cent. And the difference between 10 and 5 cents is 5 such smallest coins. It works exactly the same for the Vietnamese dong, even though the smallest coin is 200 dong. Uh, so the difference between 2,000 dongs and 1,000 dongs is again five smallest coins. To test the prediction, we consider whether the value differential between coins is smaller in pairs of coins that share the same design on the left 
compared to pairs that do not share <coughs> the same design on the right. In a currency that validates our prediction, like this one, coin pairs that share the same symbol, like 1, 2 or 5, 10, tend to be in the low value range. But as coins raise in value, their symbols change more, they become more informative, and so value differentials are higher for different design pairs uh, than for uh, same design pairs. What do the real data look like? In blue, you can see all the currencies that validate the prediction. So the average value differential for same design coins is lower than for different design coins. The red lines show the opposite pattern, so currencies that refute the prediction. We only considered 64 currencies, those for which coin designs are neither all the same nor all different, because quite a few currencies have a different design for each denomination. The blues here clearly seem to predominate, and the statistical analysis confirm this result. We attempted to replicate this analysis on ancient coins. The ancient Mediterranean is a very exciting place for coinage, because that's where it was invented. We are so close, in fact, to the beginnings of coined money. You could think that optimal denomination signaling might not work here. When you think about it, adapting design informativeness to coin values is nothing trivial. It's a subtle cognitive trick, and not all modern systems do it. So it's worth asking whether the ancients were aware of this constraint. Of course, it's much more challenging to work with ancient data compared to modern currencies. We don't have a neat synchronic snapshot of all the coins in existence at time t. We have to make do with data that is heterogeneous in many, many ways. And that requires quite a bit of cleaning up. We are indebted to two databases that we adapted, but that already did beautiful work. We aggregated data from Mentis and Pseudogum Numotum Grecorum. We selected around 7,000 unique coin types. What we called a unique coin type is a unique combination of a polity, for instance, Athens, a value, like a drachma, and a design, for instance, a owl and a goddess. So what do the data look like? Well, it sort of looks like this in abstract format. We could have, for instance, three uh, city-states, Alpha Polis, Beta Polis, Gamma Polis, and each has its own currency structure, and each has its own designs, usually with no numbers whatever on them. We cannot use here the smallest coins ID, because the data is too heterogeneous, and also because this data aggregates multiple time periods. So we use a different measure to test our hypothesis, conditional entropy. In short, conditional entropy answers the question, when we know the design of a coin, when we can see the motifs on it, how much does that help us knowing the coin's denomination? So how much does that help us knowing whether it is a noble, a half noble, a tetradrachma, etc.? That is the amount of money that the coin stands for. Just to look at a few toy examples, here's Alpha Polis. The currency here has a different design for every denomination, so just seeing the designs tells you everything you need to know about the denominations. In other words, conditional entropy is minimal. Um, if you look at gamma polis, or at beta polis, on the other hand, it's the opposite pattern. It has the same design for all denominations, so conditional entropy is maximal, and that means the designs are uninformative. They tell you nothing at all about denominations. Gamma polis is different. It verifies the optimal denomination signaling principle, because for lower denominations, here on one litra or less, conditional entropy is maximal, designs are not informative, whereas for high-value coins, conditional entropy is minimal. Note here that we have split the currency into two halves, so high-value coins and low-value coins. We did that for all the currencies in the dataset in order to test our uh, principle. So now I'm going to plot this conditional entropy for several different classes of coins. Each one of these data points stands for one half of the currency of a certain city. So uh, um, on the left hand side we have the high denomination we have the high denomination coins and the low denominations on the right. So this could be, for instance, the high denomination coins, uh, Corinthian coins, and this could be the low denomination. Corinthian coins, or this could be the low denomination Athenian coins, etc. Conditional entropy is lower for uh, high denomination coins, so the images on the coins carry more information concerning the value of the coins when that value is high. This is the principle we wanted to show. 
we replicated this result after we normalized conditional entropy to control for the basic entropy of denominations. There's, uh, there are confounds to consider, and for instance, in ancient monetary systems, high-value coins were typically much bigger. So you could put richer graphic motifs on them. There would simply be more images on high-value coins because there are more room for them. So that makes it more likely that the designs are distinctive. That is true, but it does not explain our effect. Here again, we plotted the conditional entropy of denominations given designs, but this time the set of coins are plotted according to the number of motifs that a coin carries. As you can see, the conditional entropy drops with the number of motifs, so coins with more detailed images carry more information, but conditional entropy remains higher for low denomination coins, even when controlling for that. So this is how coins indicate value. And this is what optimal denomination signaling looks like. It is found in both ancient and modern currencies. It is a smart piece of information technology that evolved rapidly following the invention of coined money. Thanks for watching.